Good morning, everybody. This is Sunday. It's March 20th, and we are heading into week 10 of our online astronomy course. Now, usually I show you something from Stellarium at the very end of what I say to you, but right now I want to go to it at the beginning, because as I'm speaking to you, it is still winter, but in 10 seconds, it's going to be spring because it's going to be the vernal equinox. So one, right now, spring has started. You can see from the time up here, it's exactly 9.33, just a few seconds past now. And we're going to zoom in on the sun. And you can see the line, the diagonal line here going from the upper right to the lower left is a celestial equator, that's Earth's equator shot into space. And you can see right now the center of the sun is crossing that line. Now the sun's moving very slowly, you can't actually see it cross. But I can show you where the sun was yesterday. If I go to yesterday, you can see the sun was a little bit south of the celestial equator. Here it is right now. And here's where it will be at this time tomorrow. So you can see that the sun has crossed the celestial equator going from south to north. And that means this is the instant of the vernal equinox, the spring equinox, the beginning of spring. So welcome to spring. And let's start talking about what you see in the background behind you, or behind me, I should say, all of these stars in the sky. This is the same background you saw uh, the first day of class when I first talked to you. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, several years ago in Northern California. It's in Lassen Volcanic National Park. And I just went out on a moonlit night and exposed the uh, camera to the sky for about 20 seconds, um, this is what you see, these, these countless stars that are in the sky. Now, right away you notice that some of the stars are brighter, some are dimmer, and it was back around 150 BC that a Greek astronomer, Hipparchus, decided to invent a system describing how bright stars are. And he called the brightest stars in the sky first magnitude. And for instance, Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion is a first magnitude star. And then stars that are not quite as bright, he assigned to second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth magnitudes. And if you take a look at the four stars that are in the bowl of the Big Dipper, those, are, those four stars have magnitudes two, three, four, and five. So you can see how the brightness of those four stars declines just by going around the bowl from brightest to dimmest. Finally, six magnitude star is the dimmest object you can see, the dimmest star you can see with the naked eye. And so all the stars that you see in the sky out during the night, those are all stars that are brighter than six magnitude, six magnitude or above. And when I say above, we have to be careful because in the magnitude system, brighter means a smaller magnitude. So first magnitude is as bright as you can see in the sky. The brightest stars are around first magnitude. The dimmest star you can see with the naked eye is six magnitude. And the difference, six minus one equals five. And it turns out that a difference in five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness. And so a first magnitude star is 100 times brighter than a six magnitude star. So what else can I tell you about the stars? Well, one of the first things anybody wanted to know about the stars was the distance to the stars. And so how can you find the distance to the stars. The stars are much too distant to send a spacecraft there, except for the sun, of course. But stars other than the sun are much too distant to study directly. And how can we find the distance to them then? Well, astronomers use a technique 
called parallax. And let me explain how parallax works. As Earth orbits the sun, we're looking at the stars from opposite sides of Earth's orbit. So we might see the stars lined up one way at a certain time, and then six months later, we'll see them lined up slightly differently because we're viewing the stars from a different perspective as the Earth goes around the sun. And so the position of a nearby star will shift against the distant background stars. And the distant background stars don't appear to move because they're so far away, but nearby stars will appear to shift. Now, let me demonstrate that to you. And I want you to do this, watching this. I want you to uh, just hold out your hand, hold out your, your hand with your thumb. And I want you to put your thumb directly over your, my nose. So put your thumb, you know, hold your thumb about uh, maybe six inches away from the screen or, or a foot away from the screen, whatever's convenient. And then put your thumb so it's directly between your eye and my nose. And when I say your eye, I want you to close. Let's say you close one eye and just look through the other eye. Just close one eye and then line my thumb, line your thumb up so it's just covering up my nose. Okay, leave the thumb there. And now change eyes. And when you change eyes, you'll notice that your thumb isn't covering my nose anymore. You're looking from a different point of view when you've changed eyes. And this is just like a nearby star, which is like my thumb, shifts against the distant background stars, which is my nose on the screen. So it's like your eyes are the position of Earth. One eye is the position of Earth at one point in its orbit around the sun. And the other eye is the position of Earth six months later in its orbit around the sun. And you can see the position of my nose of your thumb on my nose shift as you change eyes. That's parallax. And that's how we measure the distance to stars, the nearest stars anyway. And in fact, it wasn't until the 1830s that that was first measured. Now I have an old astronomy book here. You can tell it's really old. I'll show you the book. The book is An Introduction to Astronomy. And this was published in 1839. It's a textbook written for students at Yale College. And I want to show you something first about the book. I've put in a slip of paper here. And this slip of paper divides the book into two parts. And you can see here that there's one part that has a lot of pages and that's about the solar system. Now the rest of the book, which is just this much, is about the stars. So astronomy back then was just about the solar system, the sun, uh, and things like that. But the study of the stars, the constellations and so on took up just this much of the book. But the reason I wanted to say something about this book was I'm looking here under a section called The Nature of the Stars, and there is a footnote. They're talking about how far away the stars are. And in a footnote, here's what the author writes. He says, very recent intelligence informs us that Professor Bessel of Konigsberg has obtained decisive evidence of an annual parallax in the star 61 Cygni, amounting to 0.31 arc second. Now an arc second is 1 3,600th of a degree. So it's a tiny sliver of a degree. And 61 Cygni's parallax, it's that little shift that we talked about is only about a third of an arc second. This makes the distance to that star a 
a distance that would take light 10.3 years to traverse. So that star, 61 Cygna, according to Professor Bessel and reported for the first time in this book, was 10.3 light years away. Today we know it's 11.4 light years away. So it would take light 11.4 years to reach us from the star 61 Cygni in the constellation of Cygnus. But that is the first time that we had any idea how far away a star was. And it's an immense distance. And people were just amazed at how huge that the sky and then the universe must be. And they didn't even know then what the universe was. So this is the very beginning of stellar astronomy. Now, if that little angle, if, you know, suppose I was to travel away from the sun. So I just go farther and farther from the sun. And I'm looking back at the sun and I'm looking back at earth, which is over to the side of the sun from how I'm traveling. And I go back so far that looking at the, uh, at the sun and then at the earth over at the side, the angle between those two was one arc second, one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. Well, that distance I would be from the sun is defined to be one parsec, one parallax arc second. Parallax arc second, par parallax arc second, parsec is a distance of about 3.26 light years. And that is a convenient distance measure for measuring the distances to stars. And so in fact, the nearest uh, star, which is Proxima Centauri in the constellation of Centaurus, is a little bit over one parsec away. It's about four light years away. So what else are we gonna find out about stars? There is so much in this, um, in this chapter about stars. Uh, you'll learn how stars are classified. And stars are classified by their spectra. And they were given letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And those letters were rearranged. And when those letters were put in order from the hottest stars to the uh, coolest stars, they were in an order of O, B, A, F, G, K, M. O stars being the hottest, M stars, being the coolest. And these were, this was determined just by looking at the spectra of the stars. Remember we talked about looking at the absorption, the dark absorption lines that you can see in a star spectrum. And so this classification was done on the basis of the star's spectra. So from hot to cold, OBAFGKM, and you'll learn that uh, using a mnemonic that, you know, generations of astronomy students have learned. And it is this, O, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me. So you can choose girl or guy, whatever your preference is. And O, be a fine girl or guy, kiss me is how you remember O, B, A, F, G, K, M. What else can we learn from looking at the light from the stars? Well, it turns out that as a star emits light, if that star is traveling towards you, it's catching up with its own light waves and it's causing those light waves to grow shorter. That means the light from that star is going to look a little bit more blue. And so if a star is approaching you, its spectral lines will be shifted toward the blue. And that is called a blue shift. It was first uh, that idea that you can hear, this is for sound, that you can hear the difference in sound as a source of sound is moving towards you or away from you, it was first discovered by Christian Doppler a long time ago. And maybe you've sat at a, a crossing, a train crossing, a train is going to go by you, it's blowing its horn, and you can hear the difference in the pitch as the train goes by. 
someone is coming towards you, you hear a higher pitch when it's moving away, you move a lower pitch, and here's how it sounds. Let me do that again. So as the train is coming towards you, it's catching up with its own uh, light waves and you hear a higher pitch. Just like when that source of light, that star is coming towards you. It's catching up with its own light waves. So the train was catching up with its own sound waves. The light's catching up with its own sound, uh, light waves. Either way, the wavelength gets smaller and in sound, you hear a higher pitch. For light, the light is shifted toward the blue. Now, as the train is pulling away, so it's going meow. There, the train is moving away from its own sound wave. So those sound waves are stretched out. Just like as a star moves away from us, the light waves that are coming from it to us are stretched out. And so the star appears a little bit more red. And in fact, the spectra of those stars are shifted toward the red. Now, when I say the star appears a little bit more red or blue for the stars that are in our galaxy, that motion is so small that it causes the spectral lines to shift, but it, you can't really detect it in the colors of the stars. The colors of the stars in the sky are due to their temperature. But when we come to study other galaxies, we'll find out that their colors do change. So you'll find out about Doppler shifts, and you'll find out about how we find the masses of stars. We find the masses of stars uh, by using binary stars. Those are two stars that are moving around each other. Two stars are orbiting each other. And you can use Kepler's laws to measure the masses of those stars. And you'll learn about that too. Finally, you'll you'll synthesize a lot of that information and study a diagram. And I want to show you that diagram. It's a very famous one. It's this. This is a graph and it plots the luminosity of a star, the energy given off per second in terms of the sun's luminosity. So one here means the star has the same luminosity as the sun. 10 means it has 10 times the sun's brightness. 100 means it has 100 times the sun's brightness. And down below, uh, this is one tenth of a solar luminosity. So this star is be, would be one tenth of the sun's brightness, one one hundredth of the sun's brightness and so on. So that's plotted on the vertical axis on the horizontal axis is the sun's temperature. I'm sorry, is the star's temperature. And it's in degrees Kelvin. And astronomers do everything backwards, it seems. You know, magnitude's brighter as a smaller magnitude. On, the, uh, on this diagram, we plot this, the lower temperatures over on the right and the higher temperatures over on the left. So cooler stars are over on the right Hotter stars are over on the left. And you think, well, that means every star, depending upon how uh, its surface temperature and its brightness can be put on this diagram. And you think stars, stars would just be scattered all over the place, but they're not. 80 to 90% of the stars are in this line that goes from the upper left to the lower right. And that is called the main sequence of stars. Stars up here on the upper right corner are not very hot, but they're very bright. And that's because they're so huge. These are the giant and supergiant stars. And the stars down at the lower left are very hot, but they're not very bright. And that's because they're so small. Those are the white dwarf stars. And it might be wondering, well, how do the stars get up here to become supergiants? Or, and how do they become white dwarfs? We'll talk about that in the next module, where we talk about the lives of stars, how stars are born, how they live their lives.
and how they die. But for now, we're just learning how we know anything at all about the stars. And I hope you enjoy learning about that. If you have any questions about this material, please let me know. And I'll be happy to set up a Zoom meeting with you. We can meet in person in my office. But enjoy learning about these amazing objects that are all around us in the sky, the stars. So I hope you have a good week and I look forward to seeing you next time. So until then, bye-bye.